Okay, so today we're going to cover a few of the harder questions. Luckily, we have someone who's smart enough to help us answer them. So Lior and I have talked before about gold prices and using precious metals as a start over fund. And we're going to touch on that a little bit again in this one, but we get a little deeper on timing. And speaking of deep, this one did start off pretty deep. We started off talking about tapering and its potential impact on the markets, but because we talked for about 50 minutes, I got pretty aggressive with the editing. And I'm going to launch this deeper into the conversation where I put the question to Lior of how he'd allocate $40,000 of hypothetical investment capital. And this is a particular area of expertise for Lior, so you should listen to it for sure. But if your only interest is in gold and silver, then I won't hold it against you if you want to jump straight to the third chapter. In the third chapter, we get into Lior's strategy for buying precious metals, and it gets really interesting. And if you haven't heard from him before, you should know that he's a big proponent of precious metals. So when I start this off, or at least the launch point that we're going to start this off from, when I start off asking him how he'd allocate that $40,000 of investment capital, well, he's coming at that question as somebody who already has quite a bit of physical gold and silver. And if you watched the last one, you might remember that he has physical holdings to cover more than two years of expenses. And if he didn't have that base of metals, then he'd have a completely different answer. And he does get into that. He explains that in the third chapter. And then after that, he explains where he thinks the prices of gold and silver are going and why. But rather than have me just sit here and tell you what he's about to say, let's just jump into it. I caught most of that. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, so I, I think to get my brain around this, I, I think about each of the markets individually, and, and you don't. It's very clear that you see kind of how they affect each other. And so uh, as I look at this, and I think probably a lot of people who are watching this look at this, they're wondering at the base level, if I have X amount of cash to put into an investment or an asset, uh, where do I put it? And the general consensus is that everybody feels like there are a lot of bubbles. And I mentioned that idea of a bubble, stock market being in a, bu in a bubble. And, and in the general sense, uh, that I think that's probably all driven by that Fed's bond buying. And I, I wonder if, if you had $40,000 to invest, and invest is a weird word, but put it in assets or investments, where would you put it? How would you carve it up? Right now, I would probably leave half in cash uh, if I'm not invested. So I'm 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 a, I'm invested. Uh, there's a lot of uh, equity that um, I have bought in the past six and seven years, and so my cost basis for a lot of uh, my portfolio is 2015, 2014, 2013 prices. And even if uh, another March 2020 happened, I was still up. And so my brain, if I'm, an, if I'm a new investor or, or if I have 40000 in cash right now, I don't like the risk reward in most asset classes. So I would probably leave 20 in cash. Now, people are saying, okay, 20 in cash, that's, that's ridiculous. You, you know, in, uh, inflation is like 4 or 5%, even more, let's say, you know, 7 8%. The reason is that here, this is the devil I know. I know that I'm going to lose three or four or five percent in purchasing power from this year to that to, to the next because of inflation. I know that boogeyman. I don't know what's going to happen in next year um, for stocks, for bonds. Uh, bonds have been incredibly volatile and, and for other things because there are a lot of uncertainties right now um, in, in both the market and in real estate and in other alternative. Um, uh, asset classes that you mentioned, I would probably be half in cash because it gives me the optionality in one year to, um, to potentially participate in a lot of bargain hunting um, because most of what we've seen in the past year and a half has been because of the intervention of central banks and governments. Um, it has not been because fundamentally we have a much better economy um, than we did in, uh, in February of 2020. And it's certainly uh, nothing happened to your home. Uh, the home you live in 
is the same home. You look at the living room, you look at the kitchen, you haven't done any improvements, yet your house has gone up tremendous amount. And it has to do with supply chain shortages, poor shortages, a lot of problems that happen because we closed supply chains around the world and ended globalism in March of 2020. So I think a lot of these areas are going to come back down. I'm not saying a crash, but I'm definitely seeing a soft landing, especially if the Fed starts to tighten up uh, interest rates, because those are the, the driving factor of uh, people taking loans, low interest rates and low 30-year uh, bonds. So I like cash, and cash is an asset class. Remember that. Cash is a good asset class. 28% of the time, cash beats stocks. Can I repeat that? 28% of the time, cash beats stocks historically over the past 100 years. You're not taking uh, an asset class here that's guaranteed to lose. No, a third of the time, it wins. And you're seeing 2021 is a year where the markets have, have made um, over 50 new all-time highs. That's every three days, one of the major indices, the Dow, the, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ are a new all-time high. That's, that's not a, a normal year. And while this is happening, more than half of the companies in those indices are at 52-week lows. And when that happens in, in such a way that the index is going to an all-time high, while, while most of the component companies are going to an all-time low, that happened before. The year was 1999 and 2000. And so um, the, the lessons from the past uh, are certainly uh, stuff I think about. We've also seen the consumer sentiment uh, surveys right now from the University of Michigan. These are the most reliable surveys of the consumer uh, that are put out there. And they all tell you the, the buying conditions right now are the toughest we've seen in our lifetimes. Reason, it's, uh, everything is too expensive. Whoever hasn't invested in the last year has missed out on the big uh, bounce back. Right now, this is not the risk reward that you had last year when everything was on a fire sale. Um, so that's how I, I would use half of it. Um, another, uh, I would say another 10 out of the 40, I would put in fixed income um, asset classes. Personally, I lend money to real estate. Uh, projects, it, it's between 8 to 10% fixed. Um, and it's a one-year duration or two-year duration at the most. Now, there, there are um, uh, several platforms out there where you can do way less than 10,000. You can do even 1,000. Um, and those uh, are either crowd uh, real estate lending um, or crowdfunding. So you're not lending. You literally own a, a fraction of let's say 40 retirement homes or 40 hospitals or whatever, depending on the deal that you're getting into. Um, and, and these are very easy to do. You set up a, an account with, uh, with some very good companies and you do that. I would do that with 10%. Um, I'm sorry, with 25% uh, or 10,000 10, out of this hypothetical uh, 40,000. And I would actually look into the stock market with a quarter. Not to the indices, though. Within uh, the market today, there are still uh, attractive companies. Like I said, 300 or more companies in the S&P 500 right now are 52-week lows. So it's a matter of doing uh, that research within um, uh, the, the indices. Uh, because when you hear that the markets are at all-time highs, sure, you don't have to buy the market. You can buy specific things inside of uh, the market, if that makes sense. So I like that. And actually, uh, if you go to our website, to Wealth Research Group, and you click on that top menu, we've added two new features that I think are you know, plain to your question. One uh, is called watch lists. And those are actually companies that I either am personally invested in right now, or am looking to invest in if they drop to a certain price that I actually mentioned in the report. Secondly, I added one, another tab right now, literally um, uh, uh, yesterday, that's called live portfolio. And that actually displays my portfolio um, as we speak. So uh, every stock that I own, the cost basis, how much uh, of a percentage it is of my portfolio, whether or not I added or decreased in the last month, or if I didn't do anything, et cetera. Just 
uh, a way to see that there is a way to invest even today. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You're basically what you're saying here is we're at all time highs on so many things that it, it's tough to come in. Now, one thing that I would say that's very important is that that question went out to a lot of people who I think are interested in buying precious metals and everybody's going to have a different foundation, a different base, what they already have. So somebody who already has gold, who already has silver, like you do, probably sure. isn't going to be, you know, out really feeling like they have to catch up with that. And I think that's important that some of the people watching this might not know that you already have a lot of different things where if a bubble did pop, you would have some, some backup, some start yes. over funds. So uh, maybe real quick as a, as, a, as a reminder, how do you, how are you currently set up with metals? What, what I think of in terms of precious, precious metals is I want to own 24 months worth of my lifestyle burn rate in physical precious metals. So I look at how much my family burns on a single month. I multiply that by 24 or two years, and I converted those fiat currency savings into 80% uh, physical gold and 20% physical silver. And that's how I feel protected in terms of like my savings with precious metals. That's my stack. And I revised that stack when it became less than 5% of my entire net worth. So when I said to myself, okay, I think two, two years was good. Now it, it became 3% of my entire net worth. Okay, I should up it to 5%. So that's my default uh, mode in terms of precious metals. On top, that's stacking though. I, never, I will never sell that. That literally will go to my children. Um, who I hope will do the same thing. Um, now there's a, the, there's the trading component to this, and this is, doesn't have anything to do with this. It, it has to do with thinking about technical analysis, what's going on in the markets, etc. cetera. If, uh, if gold drops more than 15%, I buy gold. What I do with it uh, later, it depends on, on a gazillion things. But if it drops 15%, I buy some gold. Um, I either buy the physical ETFs, the physically backed ETF, or I, I buy certain uh, uh, mining stock, uh, mining stocks ETFs, or a certain company that I like. But if if gold does that, I'm in. The same thing applies to silver with 30%. So if it drops 30%, I do the same thing, um, and then I figure out my my exit strategy. Uh, I like to to say that I, 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 I like to breathe, live and breathe the markets. I don't want to make a decision on when to sell uh, just offhand. I don't like to give a price target or something like that. I like to look at the landscape and say, good, it served, this thing serves its purpose. I'm out. Or I think there's more here that I can look at. So I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, when gold dropped below 1700 twice this year in 2021, I bought gold right? It fell more than 15% from the highs. That's it. I locked in a, a buy order. And um, obviously that, that trade is, um, is in the green. That's uh, something that I like to do. Now, if I had no gold today, then that, 40, that 40K question would be altogether different. Um, it would not be the same thing. Because I believe that before you own equities, before you own cash flow, real estate, etc., First of all, take care of that uh, savings power. Look at a, at a way to turn your savings into physical precious metals and then start to invest um, in, in, um, in growth and in appreciation, et cetera, et cetera. I think precious metals are the basis for everything else. That is what gives me the, um, the right state of mind to start thinking about risks and um, equities, et cetera. The fact that I know that I have uh, two years worth of living expenses in, in 2021 notes um, th that I can fall back on if a lot of other things, um, you know, go south. So thank you for that question. And thank you for allowing me to, to clarify that because that to me is the basis. Yeah, I think that it's, it's very important to have that savings. And so gold is, you know, I, I personally, I like it as a savings for a number of reasons. It's been articulated to me as 
me buying gold to kind of protect that savings from myself, meaning that uh, it's something that I won't mm. turn around and casually spend, that's true. which is, you know, which is great. <clears throat> and I think that's a big benefit of gold on the growth side of things is for some people who are, especially those who are new to gold, it's hard to not think of buying an asset in terms of growth. And if you spend any real time on YouTube, you're going to get that idea of gold being a hedge against inflation. And so maybe uh, the next point that we should cover is we're seeing uh, high inflation right now. And depending on who you talk to, we have different numbers, of course, but it's, it's pretty clear that we do have a lot of inflation at the moment. So maybe you can tell us why you think that gold hasn't been hitting those all-time highs if inflation is, is so wild. Sure. Now, gold is gold, right? One ounce is one ounce. It's 1971, 2020. So obviously, the ounce doesn't grow. What gives, uh, what changes is the price of gold compared to uh, everything else that there is in the world. Because one ounce in 1971 cost $35. Today, it costs $1,800. We've had a 55x move in gold. Obviously, gold works under the fiat monetary system. Nobody can argue that. Gold is not really an inflation hedge. If you plot the CPI and you plot gold, they don't correlate as much as gold correlates with something called real interest rates. And real interest rates are not, uh, are not inflation. Uh, real interest rates are the, the subtraction between how much a bonds currently yield and the CPI numbers. So uh, gold as you can see, uh, inflation is only half of the equation that determines the relative value of gold. If, um, if bond yields are low, yield less than CPI, then you're in a world where there's negative interest rates, right? Because think about, for example, the 1970s, gold was going up while the Fed was uh, jacking up interest rates above 10% and gold was going up. So the problem wasn't that uh, uh, we don't need low interest rates for gold to flourish. We need interest rates to be lower than CPI. And that's where they are in the world today. But if the market, because it's forward-looking, thinks that this is transitory, in other words, that inflation is transitory, and that in one year from now, it will fix itself, then it's starting to price that in. And so the market is under this uh, consensus that supply chain issues, these busy ports, everything that has to do with ship shortages and lumber, it's all going away. And in, in, after this whole uh, jungle, after we clear the jungle with all the machetes, then uh, once we get to that highway, the highway is probably 2% inflation. That's the consensus. And that's why, um, you know, Gold isn't at three or four or five thousand an ounce as we uh, speak. the The opportunity is if the market is wrong, if the consensus is wrong, if in, if inflation stays more than two percent for longer. In other words, if if the sticky part of it and not the transitory part ends up being more than the market thinks, and then if the Fed also has problems raising interest rates, and I'd like to address those two because those are important. So right now, the sentiment, in my opinion, on gold is wrong. One, because as I said, I don't think the Fed is going to be able to raise interest rates substantially. The entire world refinanced its mortgages last year, and corporations are addicted to debt below 1%. If, the, if you raise interest rates, you're going to collapse thousands of companies that are losing money, but are gaining in market share companies that their business model is basically to lose money, but grow and then get bought out. Um, like, a, like an Uber, for example, a company that doesn't make any money, it loses money every quarter, but it's, it's controlling a larger and larger part of its market. And then if a strategic buyer you know, would buy it, he will figure out a way to turn it into a profitable company because of the synergies of uh, their own businesses. And there are, there are thousands of companies like this that cannot survive if interest rates go up. Secondly, once you finish listening to this interview, why don't you look at all countries around the world and how much they're paying, how much they're paying you to lend them money. And you will actually see that the United States, which is 
the world's number one economy with all of its problems and 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 uh, you know woes and debts and whatever it's the number one economy in the world and it's it's obviously the most robust and in the uh diversified etc and and the government gives you about 1.3 percent for a 10-year loan in europe when you go to these countries that are way uh more problematic way less stable uh far more uh speculative they give you zero some of them don't give you anything they charge you for safekeeping their money so on a relative basis if you look at other governments japan germany uh you know all these tinier uh, nations in europe or the bigger ones like france england etc you will find out that the 1.3 percent that uh, that uh, Washington pays is already a bargain. And so when in February of this year, when the 10-year bond reached like 1.7%, that's it. It was the top. So much money flowed into uh, buying U.S. 10-year bonds that uh, the yield collapsed again because there was so much demand. And so I think we need to keep that in mind. Uh, when the Fed starts raising interest rates and interest rates rise in, in, in America, so much money flows into the states that the dollar becomes uh, you know, too much in demand for it to be uh, part of, a, of this global world that we live in. There is a limit to how much the Fed is gonna raise rates. That's my uh, first uh, claim to you. This is not the 1970s. Uh, the United States is not a creditor nation, it's a debtor nation. So many things have, have changed. You know, the United States was the, the absolute ruler of the world. And, in the late 70s. Now there's so much uh, happening uh, around the globe that uh, is creating a situation where the United States is in five to 10 years, it's not even going to be the biggest economy. It's not going to have the biggest military budget. Uh, a lot of things are changing. It's obviously only 4% of the world's population. So many things are, are, are trending down for it. So that's one thing. Inflate, in my opinion, interest rates are not something that the Fed can raise by much. Secondly, on CPI, yes, there is this transitory component and it will compress down. But the sticky part, wages and salaries, I think those are uh, going to stay up. You, you, in the real world, you don't raise wages on, on people. And then, uh, you know, call, I have never, in, in 18 years of being in business, I've never called anybody and cut his wage in my own businesses. And I, I would survey the landscape and you will see wages, once they're at a certain level, they rarely come down. So I think, th and, and wages have been going up. So I, I don't think that's coming down. And that's one thing that's important to keep in mind. Because for example, in, in you know, the United States, in a $1.50 uh, loaf of bread, the wheat component is like 10 cents. The rest is all the labor that it goes through, taking it from the field to your, you know, local Walmart. The wages of the people, that's what, that, that, that is mostly uh, the costs of the supply chain uh, in the Western world. And those are not coming down. So that's one thing, in my opinion, that, that's uh, important to keep in mind. You will not see a lot of that going away. Secondly, inflation is created by money velocity. And, uh, um, separately or uh, in contrast to the last 20 years, um, the millennials, which are the biggest demographic groups, uh, demographic group in America, comprising of 83 million people, have hit something called peak earning years. And it's where their wages are hitting those years that, um, uh, that the compensation is the best. And those years tend to correlate with family formation, with buying homes, with going on vacations, with spending. Um, and so only a third of American workforce is currently millennials. By the time we hit 2030, it will be 75%. And so I think that we haven't even seen the start of money velocity in the United States. And therefore I think inflation will stay elevated for many more years. So I think the market is wrong and that's an opportunity in terms of gold and, and in silver. The last thing 
is the dollar index. I think the if you look after you finish the interview and look at something called the DXY index, you will see that compared to other fiat currencies, the dollar has been in a bull market since 2011, and it peaked in April of 2020. A nine-year bull market is um, it's classic for the dollar. You will see it go through nine-year bear markets and nine-year bull markets, nine-year bear markets, nine-year bull markets um, over time, and they go from 130. On the index, you can see that that's where it peaked even the last time. It's, it's like a laboratory, it's so, it's so precise. And once it hits the 90 point level, that's uh, the uh, equilibrium between bull market and bear market. And if it breaches below, if it dips below 90, you're in a bear market. Twice this year, we've already hit uh, 90 and failed to, um, to break. Uh, that's support level. But if we break below that to 88 and 87, there are so many algorithms that are uh, in, in the Forex that are trained to sell once that happens, that it's going to be an official dollar bear market. And like I said, a dollar bear market is uh, about eight to nine years. So we are entering a part of a cycle where money velocity is going to increase because of millennials and the dollar is entering a bear market. I mean, it's the perfect storm. There's a lot to unpack there. Does that, do you think that that correlates to gold prices or just kind of everything in general? It's going to correlate a lot to silver prices, first of all, uh, because silver is much more correlated with dollar weakness. But yes, in general, I think that it, it correlates with gold prices. Uh, since the bottom uh, in December of 2015, where gold hit 1,053 an ounce, it's doubled. And uh, in the 1970s, the, go the dollar, the uh, gold bull market ended up being a 24-fold move, so 2,300%. In the 2000s, from 2000 to 2011, it was 850%. If, if the uh, gold peaked in August of 2020, this would be the most lame and moderate bull market uh, in, it, you know, uh, sure. in the last 50 years, only a double. I think that's... Um, abnormal. And it's abnormal because of the reason that I just gave you. Interest rates will stay negative. The dollar entering a bear market. Uh, De-dollarization around the world. Peak gold mining output uh, that happened in 2018 and is uh, actually on the way to being half. So the output for gold in 2018 is going to be half. We're going to have half of that in 2024. So you also have a, a supply crunch. Um, and then silver. Silver has actually done nothing uh, in this bull market. <laughs> so it's not even a bull market, right? We, we even hit 123 to one on the gold silver ratio in 2018. So all of these are telltale signs that this is uh, nowhere near being uh, the end of the bull market for uh, precious metals uh, as I see it. Yeah, I feel like a lot of that question comes from people who bought in uh, at the at the peak of the hype. So a lot of it, it's like anything. By the time you hear about that investment and you've made your decision to finally buy in, a lot of a lot of the buying opportunity is gone. So you have people who came in heavy and they probably have a, a high cost average because they were buying mm. into that August. And now we're uh, deeper into the year and we're seeing the CPI numbers actually coming in and confirming that we've got high inflation. So now people are looking at it and say, okay, well, I've had a 15% loss from August. And uh, well, maybe not quite that at this point, but that's where it was in, in March and April. And at the, at the same time, or at least shortly thereafter, we started seeing those CPI numbers come in. So they don't match up. I think probably the takeaway is you don't buy gold for a six month turnaround or a six month return, you probably have to hold it a lot longer than that. That's yes, that's clear and that. you buy it after dips, not yep. after rallies. So that's the safest thing uh, that, that you can do. Well, I think that is a pretty good place to stop. I think that's great advice. Be patient, watch for those dips, for the big buys, make sure you have a foundation in place. I don't think the advice gets much better than that. So I'm gonna let you get back to your day. So Lior, Thanks again for joining. Always appreciate your insight. I'm going to cut that up a little bit because uh, you are a super technical person. Uh, <laughs> and I just I just know that if people are listening to you, they're probably expecting like high level stuff. 
uh, because you're a high level person. So I, well, I cater to I the audience. A little bit. Well, I guess I appreciate that. 